Welcome to Season 2, Episode 4 of Art Brunch Archives. Each week on Twitch, we bring in a new contemporary artist to talk about their work, to have a few drinks, and hang out with us. Uh, I'm the host of Art Brunch, Rick Bowling. We'll be joined soon by my co-host, Jake Leach. The most recent Art Brunch episodes are exclusively on Twitch, so for the two weeks after we stream them live, they stay there. Um, but every week, we're uploading the backlog, the, the archives of the show, in podcast and on YouTube. The difference between the two is the YouTube version has the middle hour of the show where we talk about art. So often we're looking at images on the screen um, and talking about visual things. So you can watch that on YouTube. Um, but our podcast is all of the hijinks, all of the fun, silly, quirky segments that we have for Art Brunch. Uh, please take a moment right now before we move forward to like and subscribe if you're listening to us on podcast. If you rate it and leave a review, that would mean the world to us. It really does help out. And I do have to also just ask you to watch the show with us live on Twitch. You can interact with the guest in real time. You can kind of be a part of it. It's really the way the show is meant to be seen. Uh, so give that a shot if you're open to it. All of those links and more are available in the description below, wherever you are. And our guest this week is Marian Lari. Um, it was an awesome podcast. She's hilarious and is doing a lot of really cool stuff in, in the area. Um, so I'm going to throw it over to Past Rick, who introduces her, and I'll leave you with that. Enjoy the show. Marian Lari is an artist and curator whose main influences are drawn from present-day fandom culture, sitcoms, the universal themes of life, death, love, and loss. She was co-founder of Bank Projects, an independent art space in St. Louis, Missouri, and is currently the curator and director of programming at Granite City Art and Design District. We'll refer to it as GCAD probably entirely today. Uh, she has shown work throughout the US and the UK. She received a BFA in sculpture from Kansas City Art Institute and an MFA in visual art from Washington University in St. Louis, where she currently lives and works. And as far as the Granite City Art and Design District, it is a consortium of creative project spaces located on the 1800 block of State Street in downtown Granite City, Illinois. As an artist-run space, they work to provide artists, musicians, and creative types an opportunity to execute and exhibit products, projects, sorry, in an alternative environment while simultaneously serving the local community and positively impacting the region at large. GCAD is a 501c3 uh, community arts forum and is a project of the Fort Gondo Compound for the Arts. So everyone give a nice warm welcome to Mary and Lari. Hello. Hey, hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Super excited to have you here. It's a nice way to wake up. So. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I think um, gives us something to do. Yeah, I think I think Sunday brunch was one of the things that made me feel really uh, somewhat productive as a way to like get started on Sunday. <laughs> so <laughs> now in this virtual world, here we are. We can still have some nice things for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Easy Maestro in the chat. Hi, welcome. Welcome everybody in the chat. Feel free to drop questions for Marianne as we move through the conversation today. Um, we'll definitely get to him. A bit of a heavier question. Can you speak to GCAD's role in revitalizing its surrounding neighborhood? And everyone likes that question. I think, I think it's awesome because it also kind of ties into um, us moving into the art conversation here. So yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I want you to answer that question and then we can, we can kind of continue down that path. Yeah. So we have the entire block of buildings minus on, uh, minus a couple. And so a couple of years ago, all of the buildings were completely abandoned. Um, there was nothing there and we had an opportunity to, um, move over there. Um, but, so the town is essentially like a steel mill town. So that's pretty much the main industry. And so like the town was really wanting to breathe some life in it outside of the steel mill industry. Hmm. So I think just by revitalizing these buildings, providing public gardens for people to walk through, 
um, providing gardens that are trying to counter what's happening at the steel mill. Um, because of the steel mill, there's so much lead contamination where a lot of things can't really grow. So we've worked with like the climate of where we are located in order to provide something beautiful for our surrounding neighborhoods. Yeah. So. Um, um, and to put into context what we're talking about and what we're talking about, this is, uh, we're talking about Granite City Art and Design District. I have it highlighted here on the map. Um, you can see you can see St. Louis down here, and it's not that far away, right? So like, not at all. It's like 15 minutes away from where I live, which I'm really close to downtown. So. I was reading a St. Louis Mag article. They did a really good piece on on you all, uh, or and maybe it was St. Louis Mag or, or somebody else, but they were like, mm -hmm. uh, part of the the messaging around GCAD is that it's closer than Trader Joe's, like <laughs> <laughs> to to like people in the city. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think Galen came up with that, uh, or somebody came up with that. But like, it is it is true. Like the amount of time it takes me to get from my house in Tower Grove South to Trader Joe's is less time than it takes me to get the GCAT, and that's a really helpful perspective, I think. Yeah, that was something when I first started out at GCAD, which it's almost been four years, I think. Um, but when I first started out there, that was some a problem that I was facing is when, you know, we're on the Illinois side of the river. Um, and so whenever I would talk to people about it, they'd be a little bit put off by it because the, you know, the state of Illinois is stamped on it and people just assume that it was so far away. Hmm. Um, so I just had to tell people like, Hey, it's literally like across the river. You just drive <laughs> over a bridge and you're right there. So right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, to Dom's point, um, one of the things that I found uh, really interesting was being able to go back in time. So uh, if you go to April 2013 in Street View, you can kind oh, wow. of see like what this street looked like. Um, and these these are just like two buildings that you all have turned into galleries. So if we move to 2019 then you can see like clear evidence of this this revitalization of these buildings and and the way that the space has changed yeah and i should add so the one that's to the left of see where the silver silver facades are there's the one next one? to it with the white um so th to the left this we one? call it in and out mm -hmm. uh go the other this? way oh. no no. Sorry, back to <laughs> the one that's on the one that's on the corner there, with the, the, the glass door. Front. Yeah, okay. Um, so that space in particular, the it was insane. Um, it was filled to the brim with stuff, and like the roof was like collapsing. The city essentially wanted it to be bulldozed, um, which is the case mm. for a lot of the buildings down there. And so, like, we kind of go by the the phrase like one man's trash is another man's treasure. Um, and I think that's really the case for this building is just re-envisioning uh, a space that other people just view as trash. Is there anything in particular that you remember finding in there that maybe you still have to this day by chance? Gosh, I should send some photos. Um, we, yeah, I mean, we don't throw anything away. <laughs> yeah. If you look behind some of those spaces, you'll see. Um, so at the very beginning, like we, a lot of the stuff that was in this space was just stapled to the front of the building. And I think there were like crutches and <laughs> like lots of like weird sculptural kind of objects. Um, I don't think there was anything in particular that stood out other than like some really interesting framed artwork. Okay. So, like so you're saying it was already an art space before you guys even showed up. There was sure. Yeah. Crutches yeah. That, you know, really spoke to, the healthcare industry of America, like it was, it was in oh, yeah. performance before you guys even arrived is what you're saying. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and another big aspect of it, the thing that you mentioned, um, one of the specific things that you mentioned was also like the, um, the environment. I think something that comes up a lot with, with you all is with this, this garden that's uh, being like turned into a play, uh, a park space as well. And kind of like creating green spaces over there even though that there's like a lot of pollution in the soil and mm -hmm. finding like plants that work i mean this is this still even feels old this was march 2019 like there's a lot more going on in in this park space as there was or even even here but if we look 
beforehand, you know, it, it feels really kind of blighted and and bleak. And that's that's another another way that I think um, GCAT is kind of revitalizing the the space there. Yeah, it's definitely like a reverse parking lot idea. Like, you know, a lot of spaces bulldoze things and then just pave over it. And mm. we're doing the opposite of that in this um, and what this is called slot lot. So. Um, but yeah, so if you could see like all of the, the, the building behind that's painted that blue color, mm -hmm. that's all the steel mills. So if you drive around Granite City, yep, that's the, so anything that you see that particular shade of blue is part of the steel mill. Oh, wow. You can see those are, we call those our mountain, our mountain range. So. <laughs> Very cool. Blue, the the uh, blue rigid mountains, I guess. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And then getting into, um, you know, what's what's taking taking place here now, and and these are you know some of the most recent and, and relevant photographs that that go beyond the street view, <laughs> you know. I think they they come around every few years. Um, <laughs> but there are you are uh, you are curating the shows that are taking place and also um, creating the the programming for this space, which we said before, but I think also it's good just to remind everyone um, here. So you're a visual artist, but recently you've been, for the past, I, th I think like three or four years, you've been very focused on programming for the gallery and curating the gallery. Yeah. Yeah, I think like, I, you know, so I went to school to create art and you know, after you graduate, you have this this like post studio shock where you don't really have a space to produce work and you you're out into the real world and you're just wondering if like that was just a phase where you can like express yourself in one way and then figure out the next step and I think mm. this has been the next step for me um I still view this as part of my practice it's just I'm not making anything I'm in a sense collaborating with the artists that are showing at at our space so this is definitely I view this all as a collaboration like mm -hmm. for sure yeah what was, um, were you interested in uh, curation and um, operating like gallery spaces while you were in school? Was that something that started to come up for you then? Or was it just a product of that like existential crisis post-grad? Yeah, so in when I was living in Kansas City, like a lot of, the, I was in the sculpture department there and a lot of the, part of the program there was figuring out where you're going to be showing your work. And mm -hmm. that was something that I was really interested in. Like a lot of people just expected things to be handed to them. And I, I don't like going about that. Like I want to work for what I'm doing. Um, so I think that's where the interest sparked in me. And then I moved back to St. Louis to go to Wash U for uh, grad school. And when I came back here, we, uh, I moved with a couple of friends and we found this really cool old bank building that we mm -hmm. figured could be a live workspace sort of thing. And I think that's when I really wanted to go further deep into the um, programming realm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was, that was bank projects, which I mm -hmm. um, admit I, I never went to, uh, but that was, that was your first, your first project. Yeah, this building it was just so cool. Like he, it was literally, it was actually like a payday loan place. Um, and it really, again, it kind of goes back to the one person's trash is another person's treasure. And when we walked in, like this building was just like disgusting. I mean, there's uh, mold on the walls. There were clothing, like clothes everywhere. Like so, whoever worked there was also living there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we cleaned it up and did quite a bit of work. And it just, it was an incredible space, but. Um, it just didn't, it wasn't something that I could maintain at the time. It was expensive and I was still in school. And is that something that, to... is that something that you cherish as like a, as like a part of this practice is, is this like transitioning of a space from, like you said, like one person's trash to someone else's treasure, because it kind of like comes up in bank and that's something that you're doing with GCAD. Do you think it's a consequence of like the levels at which you're operating as a gallery or is, is that something that you think adds uh, additional value to these creative projects? 
Totally. I mean, I think one of my favorite moments is when we have somebody who comes out often and every time they like they comment on how the space looks new in some way. And I think that's probably one of the more exciting bits of my involvement at GCAT is like, yeah, people just coming and saying like, oh my gosh, like this has changed or this has changed. And sometimes it's big and sometimes it's small, but, um, and I think that's what keeps it fresh for me as well. Like, you know, sometimes things can get a little bit stagnant, but like with, you know, changing the buildings changing or the plants changing, like, that's what really keeps me, keeps me going. Hmm. Um, yeah. And well, that, I think, go ahead, Jake. Oh, sorry. I just, I, I think that um, repurposing space, I think in specifically places like St. Louis or Granite City in this case, um, I think can, can ride a, a line that is maybe hard to navigate sometimes in terms of the, the way that these cities have shifted over the decades. Um, however, I feel like if put into the right hands almost and, and, you know, defining right, who's to say, I guess, but, um, I think if you, you can very clearly see like when people care, you know, and I think if that's the, any metric you can go by, um, I'm just curious, having worked in kind of those spaces, like the, the sense of care that kind of comes with that is, is that kind of like a, a pillar uh, I, I think it shows very clearly, and this is kind of an obvious question, but I'm just curious what conversations kind of have come up with uh, kind of like the care for a space like that. Care, but it's also like an opportunity. And I think that's really what inspires us is like, you see this building that's essentially a blank canvas and you're like, hey, we could do whatever we want. Like, mm -hmm. as long as nobody's going to get hurt here, like, that's it's an it's an amazing thing that not a lot of people are able to do and so i think it's a cool opportunity to try like architecturally even just something that's like a little bit absurd and if you don't like it you can knock it down and start over and i think that's the beauty of uh, what we have there is any everything that we do isn't we don't view it as permanent mm -hmm. um it could be changed up at any time like if we get bored we'll cut it down and start over and so that that's yeah, I just love being involved in some a project that we don't ever see a finish line. Like we're never going to live to see GCAD complete. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and if it's if it's in with the cadence of um, curating shows is what it seems too is that uh, when like each show you want to make it the best that you can, and and that's something that like I understand inside of the creative practice is like wanting to make the thing that you're working on the best that it can be, but also recognizing that these, depending on the, the way that you work, like these things are temporary from the very beginning. And like, you don't have to check every single box with every single show that you're putting together. And things don't, you know, like I'm sure you've, you've learned through the act of making in these spaces that like, oh, this doesn't work, you know, this this doesn't work as like a curated element. Um, this creates trouble, but also like these spaces create trouble. And like we want to continue to find that experimentation and make trouble for ourselves as we, we move through this experience. Yeah, definitely. I think experimentation is definitely a big part of what we do. And um, yeah, I think we're all about accepting failure <laughs> sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's what we tell artists as well. Like, you know, a lot of spaces have a, a set idea of like, okay, I want to work with this artist. This is the work I want them to show. And we're kind of the opposite where we want artists to be able to view the space as an experiment, like a space for them to do something that they've thought about wanting to do, but it might be a little bit outside of what they're used to. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's amazing. I mean, a lot of artists have like really run with it and been successful and it's reshaped their practice. And it's, it's something that's exciting for me to be a part of as well. Like knowing that they've had the opportunity to do something different than what they're used to. I, I, I'm, I'm very new to the art world and getting art terms down, but one, I, I think a fair amount of people know would be site specific art. And I, I almost feel like museums kind of exist in a space where you kind of don't you disappear right whereas like galleries maybe themselves in general are almost site specific because they're not going to be in these uh, most of the time at least hyper-funded spaces if nothing else that like gcad i think even 
seems to expand even broader on that idea of like if a gallery is a site specific place that working with this is like well an artist might be able to work with this like a street an entire mm -hmm. block you mm -hmm. know that like I think it seems to me like you guys are expanding on that idea of, you know, maybe, maybe not intentionally, I don't know, and I'm adding my own thoughts here, but um, the site-specific concept of a gallery, I think, is just uh, exploded with, with this in such a cool way. Thanks. Yeah, that's something that we have definitely are we're rethinking now, especially with the pandemic, is, you know, we're trying to move. Obviously, we have the indoor spaces, but we have so much outdoor space as well, and so we're really trying to figure out ways that we could shift programming to fit in with the, the current situation. Um, and so I think this current exhibition that we have right now has been a, a good stepping stone in that. And the artists that have shown in the, the outside space is just, I mean, it's one of the best shows we've had. And it's yeah. amazing like that they've been, they were so like willing to step outside of the white wall gallery space um, and yeah, just put on an incredible show. I'm really proud of them. Yeah. So I have a couple things on that. And um, it, Nico in the chat uh, says the experimentation is totally what makes GCAD like an adult art sandbox. Um, <laughs> that's a really cool way to put it. I, that's awesome. Uh, I might have, I'm going to write that down. That's yeah. really cool. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the second thing that I wanted to ask is what it, you know, do you find that most of the artists that, like get attracted to GCAD are are open to this idea of like alternate space or wanting to stretch their work into these different spaces? Or do you feel like part of your role as a director, as a curator is kind of like uh, shepherding them into like a greater version of maybe what they're thinking or, or a, like trying to help them broaden their perspective? Ah, that's a good question. And I think, so we only have, well, now we have two built out white wall spaces, but we also have two interior spaces that are really rough looking. Um, and sometimes, obviously we can't have everybody showing in the white walled spaces. And mm -hmm. so some of the artists that I work with, I'm like, hey, like this space, oh, sorry, a lot of these, I haven't updated those photos oh, by I'm the sorry. way. So there's only, no, it's, you're totally welcome to show them. It's just not, they're not all up there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so a lot of the artists that I'm like, hey, here's this really raw space that I think your work would look great in. And I know you're not used to it, but let's just just trust me, please. And like, <laughs> I feel guilty, like trying to push them that route. But then, you know, after like conversations, they're like, OK, I'll give it a try. And like, it's it's incredible, like how well they're able to form fit their work into those spaces and it's it's never been a problem in the long run so i hope I see. yeah 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 and and i think that it's it's also like one of those spaces that we we miss from art school is like here's like a series of constraints where you know you're now in a position where like yes you're a painter but like i have uh, you only have a scanner and a printer, so like make something out of paper, and and then you you find yourself stretching into all of these new places and translating your ideas from where they feel comfortable, but translating them into alternative material or alternative space that can be really powerful for an artist's um, creative practice. So I think at its best, you know, people can look at that and say this is a challenge like this is an opportunity for me to stretch my work or to translate my work and uh, i think that that's really powerful <clears throat> yeah i think it's i think a lot of the work should speak for itself anyway and mm. sometimes like putting it in a new location such as like an abandoned apartment building like it really it opens up a new conversation that you probably wouldn't have if it was just uh, on a, a work hung on a white wall. So I think it really, it moves the conversation elsewhere sometimes, which can be really, really fun. Yeah. So we have a couple of pictures from um, Instagram where we can, we can see how some of the work is installed and, and the spaces and um, a lot of outdoor space here 
uh, and some of the, this is like one of the more white wall galleries, but also this outdoor space, which I think was perfect for Tiffany's work. Uh, I really love the connection between these double exposed photographs with uh, covered, like glazed frames and the way that they're picking up the reflections from the light of being in an outdoor space and, and being around nature and, and plants. So I just wanted to show that to our audience to give them some perspective. That's a really interesting interpretation. And like I, so my mindset of having Tiffany's work in here in this space is, so she does a lot of, um, she goes to parks and has, has uh, black girl meetups is what she calls them. Mm -hmm. And so she'll, like everybody will get together at a park and she'll just take photos of the people that she's with. So a lot of the, like the locations that she's shooting at is pretty similar to the, the space that the work is existing in right now. And so it's really cool having that reflection of like the plants in the space and the plants in her work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And they're double exposed. And, and then mm -hmm. you have the, the, it's just like so many layers, which, which was really <laughs> like a delight. And then you're just like, I was just delighted by like the warmth of the sunlight. Like I came out, uh, I came out the Saturday after the election for the first time and we were all just having a really good time and it was like beautiful weather and um, just kind of also being able to be delighted by the outside, the outdoors, another opportunity to get some fresh air, um, which I think is really powerful. Yeah, cool. Tiffany was one of the artists that was really just like totally down to show in an alternative space. Like she was just like, let's do it. <laughs> that was really like, that made me feel really good. <laughs> well, and, and Rick, I, I think I agree with, I to the whole conversation of like artists meeting the moment. I, mm -hmm. I personally am, am really curious and interested in like new challenges as an artist. And, um, and so Marianne, to turn this into a question is like, are there, have have there has it been very natural like the people that do want to show there are up for the challenge and Rick basically asked this question but I'm also curious like have there been people who are just like I I need my one thing and if you don't have my one thing that's it yeah I def I mean that's kind of the nature of working with certain artists um, and I completely understand like I never want to force them to do something that they're not comfortable with um, and if mm -hmm. your work does I totally understand like some work just needs a white wall and. Um, so I think like, if we're not able to offer it now, we're always able to offer it later. And like, it's just a matter of scheduling it. So, okay. yeah, we try to support artists as much as possible. And like, in that sense, so. Well, and you guys have clearly given such a great amount of space to where both physically, literally in amount, but also in varieties so that it just will at some point just become like a scheduling issue at that point. Like there's, it's yeah. not like you're being exclusive or something or saying like, we don't do the white wall. It's like, no, we do just, mm. <laughs> we'll have to do it next time, you know, or something for sure. Yeah. It could definitely pose a challenge because whenever we do put um, exhibitions together, like, so we have the exhibition umbrella. So it's like exhibition number, whatever. And mm -hmm. right now it's exhibition number 24. So it's the 24th show. And then each artist, because we have so many spaces, like each artist has their solo show, but we still try to um, like, organize all the artists together so that there's like some sort of dialogue between each of their individual shows mm. um so that's another factor if, if somebody is like hey i only want this space and i'll have to wait until that space is available like sometimes that throws it off but it always somehow matches up in the end and there's always like a really cool connection between all the exhibitions yeah i'm a big fan of that like universal synergy that often comes and, and surprises us it's like mm -hmm. well, we don't really know what's gonna happen and then to continue to be confronted with everything working out and like taking the time to like recognize that things worked out because it's, it's really easy to focus on all the times where things didn't go as planned but if you if you have this this object that continues to reflect back to you that like things are going to work out and there, there are periods of uncertainty, but they often coalesce. Uh, I just, I think that's the way that the world works, you know, especially when we're, when we're living right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> living right has the happy accident model. Yeah, for sure. I think so. 
Um, in our in our, in our uh, pre-show conversations, one of the things that we um, got to that I definitely want to uh, find space for here in our communication, uh, one of the things that you mentioned is, is really important for you to share about is um, how GCAD and how these different gallery spaces around St. Louis can start to benefit from having more coordinated efforts. And that, that's something that we should continue to talk about is, is that like GCAD isn't its own island, you know, and, and like a lot of the other gallery spaces that we go to and, and even the museum spaces aren't their own island. And, and there's some valuable, uh, something valuable in bringing them together, especially in the current moment. Yeah, definitely. I think collaboration, like, as I mentioned before, it's a really important thing to me. And it's something that I'm hoping, like, we can start including, like, in our programming and our dialogue um, and everything. I mean, we can't exist without other spaces. And I think that's something that should be acknowledged, but it should also be acted on. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are some of the things that, um, I don't know, let's see. Uh, Nico in the chat says, what is the next big thing for GCAD? That's a good question. We're so right now we do have an exhibition up that's through, um, it goes through December 12th and then we're probably going to be closed a little bit just because of the pandemic and because we have so much outdoor spaces, like we really rely on good weather and it's just kind of miserable <laughs> being outside in the cold. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So we are focusing on, we did acquire a building. Um, so there's the, the in-out space, the insurance space, Greece, and then we have a new building where, that we acquired where the roof completely collapsed. Um, and so we are focusing on just revamping that space. It's going to be really incredible. Um, I think Rick showed a photo of it previously. It's the, the one where it's all construction right now. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that's the, what we're probably going to be shifting our focus on for a while. That That's it, yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. So down below it's in that sub-basement, it, it, first off, I should like explain how insane this space looked. Like the <laughs> roof collapsed. They were, they were, I mean, this was filled with stuff. I mean, to the brim. Um, and in the corner on the other side, there was like a bathroom that was like turned at a 45 degree angle. <laughs> it wow. was crazy. Wow. Um, so... Yeah, the, the staff clean staff minus me. I wasn't involved in cleaning it up, but uh, we rented a dumpster and cleaned it up. And the vision for this space is uh, there's going to be trees down below, and then there's going to be a bridge that connects the front, to the back, to the side of the building. So, and possibly an observation deck above, so that you could look down on the trees. So it'll kind of be like an opposite space in a way. Is that is that this building? Yeah, so it's okay. the the yellow the yellow building. I see. Yeah. And we don't. Uh, own... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say we don't own that blue building, unfortunately. So that's probably going to remain looking like that for some time. Interesting. It'll come around. I have to say I don't know if it's the uh, the nitro talking, but my heart sort of jumped when you talked about what the future of that particular space will be. That sounds so cool. <laughs> yeah, that's it's incredible. going to be really special. Yeah. Wow. One of the things that we also have the opportunity to do here is is kind of like get to know you and and I think some of some of this for me is like how do you spend your time? I'm I'm curious if you have if you could like because you do so much and you're 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 engaged in these various projects that are like in some ways connected but also like very different in their scope and and like you know you're going so like what is like a Marianne's percentage of time spent like how much like what percent do you do with the various things or like what are the major things that you're doing really good question it's something i've been thinking about a lot lately too um i am like as i mentioned i'm starting this business and so like a lot of my efforts are focused on figuring that out um so as far as downtime goes like it's literally just me like eating dinner and watching TV and reading and trying to turn my brain off for a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think GCAD stuff, like I, I'm really trying to get better at just like carving out, this is how much time I 
should be spending on this. This is how much time I should be carving like to spend on this. And I'm not abiding by it at the moment. So I don't know if I could really give a percentage, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's kind of, it just depends on what comes at me. So right now it's kind of a, a time to, because we already have an exhibition up, I'm not really, we have some exhibitions planned for next year. It's just a matter of when, so I'm just yeah. kind of like sitting on that until I have a better sense of what's going on. Um, I, so. shared, I shared this meme on Instagram the other day uh, that was, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about? Jake? I do. I sure do. Um, I think you, yeah, let's see. Is it involved SpongeBob? It is the SpongeBob one. <laughs> SpongeBob. Yeah. It, I don't. I don't have it, but it's it's like okay. the, uh, the meme of of SpongeBob with like his body parts all in the wrong place, and it's like artists trying to be uh, curator, marketer, um, like writer, artist, like all of the different things that artists do, like all at the same time, just trying right. to be like five or six different roles. And that, that sometimes that even feels like it's more than five or six sometimes, just kind of like plugging yourself into all of these different roles that people do is like legitimate jobs, and like take up the, your, you know, all of your time legitimately. And um, I think oftentimes we can find ourselves in this position where we are doing the marketing and we're also making the work and we're also doing course, correspondence uh, for the work. And then we're also like communicating with friends that are artists and having studio visits, but also communicating with gallerists and doing exhibitions. And there's so many different hats that we're wearing. And, um, I think that, you know, art handling, it's these things that, that you're kind of talking about. Uh, Nico agrees, definitely wearing a lot of hats. And I think that that's something that is, is clear in, in, in your experience too and it, and it sounds like you're actively trying to understand what that looks like moving forward yeah it's challenging to have to do all that stuff and like a lot of it's it's things i'm not really good at so it's nice like i have a like my husband's really good at um he helps me out with a lot of things and you know that's why <laughs> my personal website at the bottom it just says under construction and it's kind of just like my fallback i'm like i don't really know how to do web based stuff so i'm just going to use this as an excuse that it's under construction <laughs> no. uh, it's not actually i think i have all the <laughs> things i need on there but um yeah it's tough and i think that's like you know a lot of museums have all the people that fill the roles of like social media and web stuff and newsletters and all that and so i'm not i'm not the best at all of it but i I like giving it a try and um it's a little bit exhausting sometimes but it is what it is so yeah and i definitely don't want to bring make it feel down you know like we are oh yeah we're like we're powerful we're powerful yeah. because of that like you're powerful <laughs> because of that because then like you know i i imagine this future and i don't know if this future is something that you hope for but sometimes i just like imagine this future where i get to put a hundred percent of my energy into one thing that I'm like really deeply passionate about. And I'm like, Oh, when that time comes, maybe it's going to be incredible, but also like maybe it's better for me to have these different, these ways to like break out of the creative process and go into a communication method. Um, you know, these stop gaps from just like spending 24 hours a day in my studio. So I'm curious, you know, do you do you imagine a future where you focus in on on one thing really passionately, or or do you like kind of this like, you know, spinning plates deal? I I would I don't think I'd ever not do this. We I think like it's it's important for me to like I am so hands on with everything, and so mm -hmm. like for instance, doing the newsletter, it's like a way for me to step back and think about everything that's happening objectively, and like think mm -hmm. about like how can I present this to the viewer in a clear way that's, you know, I already have the in on it, but a lot of people don't. So I need to like be able to break this down very clearly so that people can understand it. Um, so I think it's a doing all these things is a good way to keep myself in check. Nice. Um, and it's also a good way to like make me realize, Oh, okay. This is like 
this is worth it. I'm always learning something new when I'm doing it. Um, so yeah, I don't think I'd ever not do it. And obviously I could always use help, but I still love, I, I do, I do love it. So. Yeah. And I, I, I just finished Queen's Gambit, so I don't see any of us as just chess masters, you know? Like, I feel yeah. like the average artist has to be kind of good at everything or at least be trying, you know? And and I, I think you can you can gain a lot from that. And anyone who's seen Queen's Gambit, you're, you'll you see that focusing just on chess 24-7 actually is not the best thing to do. <laughs> um, I, I don't know why I'm giving a shout-out to a Netflix show. But anyway, I, I really enjoyed it. I've been playing chess recently. Yeah, it might but be like, my my latent chess energy that you're feeling right now. That I think is yeah, in, infecting your perspective. And I think it's the black and white shirt, mm. Rick. I think that's getting into it. You know, just of the standard chessboard. Yeah, um, I call this shirt my King's Gambit. <laughs> for sure, or the castle. I haven't the castle. Yet. It's it's got rook vibes for sure. <laughs> anyway, I just I think that like it proves that like I I, I think artists. The ones I tend to like certainly the most are, the, or I, I maybe just get along with best are ones that are always in 12 different things at once, often for their own stuff, but it's, it's never, uh, I, I, I think with, with great responsibility comes great power, you know, if I'm quoting Star Wars, Spider-Man, I don't know which one I'm doing, but now a lot of TV talk now, I guess that's what segment we're in, but yeah. anyway. <laughs> yeah, and I mostly just bring it up as a, as a means of like inspiring other people that, and, and, and to talk about it in a way that like doesn't um, indicate that there's anything wrong with it and that that's, that's actually like the contemporary moment and uh, these dreams that we have of being, you know, just in our caves making 100% of the time and being supported in that isn't always like the healthiest thing. I know it's not the most healthy thing for me. So when Marion, you talk about like, you have these moments of reflection kind of built into the cadence of communication, GCAT, it's like, it's really easy to feel like you're not doing enough. If you don't find time and opportunity in your life to recount, like all the things that you really have done over the past week or over the past month. And I know for me, yeah. that's something that keeps me really healthy. Yeah. And that, like with the newsletters too, like I really like it, sh it. I try to view it as a celebration of like, Hey, we have this amazing exhibition by these amazing artists. Um, we have this artist who's going to be doing a portrait day. Like this is exciting. Like it's, it's just, it reminds me that there are, we've done these fun things and we also have something to look forward to. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's so good. Um, the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I had another question, but I forgot it. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh yeah. The, the thing that comes naturally out of that as we kind of wind down in our second segment here is I want you to answer this question for you as an artist or you as a person, really. And then also, like, for GCAD, it's just, like, what are the ways that you ask people to support you or, like, what are some of the best ways that people can support you um i showing up is like a really great thing like that's one of the most exciting things is just seeing people like obviously i love seeing people that i already know but i love seeing new people there as well and just getting an opportunity to talk to them and um hear what their take is because everybody has a different perspective on um what stands out to them at gcad like some people really like the swing some people mm -hmm. really like the gardens and i think it's really cool just hearing like what their favorite part of gcad is and like a lot of people like say they want to be involved and like that's also exciting and mm -hmm. so yeah i think just showing up is a really important thing um it's important you know, we, to note that when I when I was meeting up with you at GCAD, I was like, oh, where am I going to find Marianne? Is she, she going to be like in an office somewhere? Am I going to have to like call her and, and figure out where she is so we can talk? I pull up and you're just like sitting on Josh's truck bed and we're just like, <laughs> like just hanging out, like out on the street, you know, like it's not it's not like like if you go to GCAD, you're going to they're going to people are going to see you and have that opportunity to talk to you because it's kind of like a almost like a house party so, so kind of feeling sometimes and, <laughs> and you're like the host of this party which is which is cool thanks yeah i think it's like 
I, you know, we talked about this a while ago, but art places can be really intimidating and that's not the vibe that I ever want to get off. And I never want anybody to feel um, out of place. I don't want anybody to feel like their opinion isn't valid. And that's another thing. Like I really do like talking to people when they come out there and that they're, I'm like, t if they have like a thought, like whether it be a criticism or a compliment, like it's something I do take seriously. And I never want anybody to feel like out of place there. Yeah. We were having that conversation and, um, you were asking me, you know, why the travel agency and, and why what we do. And it's like, well, like accessibility to art inst in institutions like can always be more, like can always be better. And I, I said, you know, places like Pulitzer and CAM and, and even places like GCAT can feel difficult for some people to want to enter into. And I think, yeah. I think that like, it is like a healthy reminder, even though that like, you are so focused on creating like accessibility in that space that it, it's, you know, hopefully we can help just like continue to reach out and say even more people, it's okay for everybody, you know, like whatever way you, you come into it and come into contact with it, like you're going to be well received there. Yeah. I think like one of the most standout moments, like when I first started at GCAT, I kind of still had an art school perspective on it which has totally changed over the past couple of years. And mm -hmm. I think one of the moments that really like made my mind switch is, uh, so we have some neighbors that live above one of the galleries and this guy, Jimmy was showing around one of his friends and his friend, like they saw one of the, uh, the sculpture pads and his response, he was like, Oh, is this, is this a patio? And like, I just thought that was such a cool, like, yeah, you know what? It is a patio. Like everybody has an interpretation and just because it's like designed to be a sculpture pad doesn't mean it's not just actually a patio. <laughs> and I don't know. I think that moment really stuck with me and realizing that like, just because we set out for something to be one thing doesn't mean that it's not going to be another thing in somebody else's mind. And it doesn't make it any less valid because somebody thinks it's different. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, and it, it's like a way to kind of, uh, loosen our grip or or not be so like sharp or you know sharp and bitey you know i don't know is the phrase like i don't think it, the phrase is like to cut your teeth but like it's also just kind of like finding softness in inside of art spaces and and i remember i was just like a super hard-edged dude in in art school and like thought you know thought everything kind of had to come from this pure space like i i fetishize purism like purists like i think <laughs> sometimes i'm like oh they're so cool they're so they're like such purists but also like those aren't the spaces that i'm trying to be in and, and inhabit and like i got made fun of in high school way too much to want to do that to other people <laughs> to like want to yeah. make other people feel excluded yeah. yeah well and i think when you're like a kid it's hard because the you have so little power, you know what I mean? Like, I, I think about this a lot. Like the only thing you can do is exclusivity gives you a sense of power, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then, but unfortunately for a lot of people that continues into their adulthood and especially into either their art practice or something of that. And something for me specifically is like, I, I have really been trying to use the term grace, like as defined, I just looked up is the courteous goodwill and to, to, to have a space be full of grace to be bequeath grace onto people that maybe don't fit the definition of what we, you know, a target market of someone who will come out to a gallery, but they're going to bring something to the table that you could have never thought of. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. this is a patio to him. And it's like, Oh my God. Like that may have just like, you know, blown out the fourth wall, you know, in a way that it's like, this gets to be a whole other thing now. And that despite that guy, maybe not necessarily being, Mr. Cool Art Guy, like, it's actually specifically because of that is why. He forgot his beret it, at home. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> As we often do. But, you know, like, <laughs> like, to have, to allow yourself, you know, that space and to, and to have people, you know, to give them the grace to be like, oh, who is this guy? Like, you know what I mean? Like, you allowed yourself to have that moment. And now, subsequently, all of us. So, <laughs> thank you to that gentleman, in a way, but also to you. Thank you yeah <laughs> okay so i don't know i this question's dangerous 
This is like a really dangerous question. Is it spicy? It's spicy. No, it's not okay. spicy. It's 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 have to do with money. Saucy. <laughs> <laughs> no. Come on, Rick. Does it have to do with money? Let's get down to brass tacks. I here. only talk about money. Oh. Money money moves <laughs> everything around me. <laughs> dollar dollar bill. Yeah. Y'all. Um like okay, Miriam, what is your dream project? Oh gosh. Yeah. Um Yeah, I know. That's a good question. It's a dangerous question. <laughs> yes. I think I might have to think on that. I feel like we've every project has been a dream project in a way. I don't know. I know that sounds really lame, but um it's so cheesy. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think one of the dreams like I I think my dreams are being uh, revealed through each program. And I think the one that really like, it was so dreamy after the fact was we did this photo walk, which is where I guess I met Jake, Yeah. Right? Oh. Um, which was just so cool. And I didn't realize that that was a dream again until after the fact, it was just so cool. Like people, so we had a photo exhibition up and then mm-hmm. the, the programming that went uh, in uh, alongside with that exhibition was People were just invited to bring their cameras and walk around and take photos. And that was just such an amazing moment where people just showed up and like had such a cool variety of cameras, which like I've never seen before. And like, it was just so cute, like not, not cute, but just like really amazing to hear people who are really interested in this one thing. And like, they were talking to each other about like the cameras and like nerding out about the cameras. And I think that was something that's really shaped like how I went like some future programming to be is just like the, it really had a good sense of community. Um, mm. So I think something along the lines of that particular event would be a dream event, um, but maybe something even more over the top where it's like, it fits the visual art scope. It fits the music scope. It fits the gardening, you know, like captures oh, yeah. like all these creative fields. Um, so somewhat of like a carnival in a way, maybe Oh wow, an art carnival. The, the GCAD carnival and the C in GCAD stands for carnival. There you go. Absolutely. Yeah. Granite and I, carnival design district. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm well, here for I, that. As a, maybe a meta dialogue just of, of that particular one. Um, that felt very much like a dream come true to thing, even though I only had to show up and participate in it. Um, I will say I've never met more and had continuous um, communication with fellow people that I've like met at an art situation of that situation. So like not only was it primarily I think majority like film photography, I guess that people showed up for that particular one. Yeah. And yeah. um I, I I really hope that even that specific thing is done again. I want the carnival to happen too, but if if that photo thing were to happen again, even if it was just the one time which was so special, um I I don't think I've ever felt more like present but also like i just felt so inspired coming from that particular one as as someone who just attended that weekend i just truly can't describe how how awesome of an event it was for instance i will say i went down with jack garland a former guest on art brunch uh the first guest uh as me as a uh a co-pilot here um he and i still talk about that uh all the time and actually um one of the artists that showed work uh sam precop is a photographer yeah. here in chicago uh, yeah i love sam yeah he's Sam's great. In- incredible and uh yeah. wonderful musician as well um mm-hmm. jack and i were walking around uh pilsen neighborhood and we walked past him actually on the street and i felt really bad he was like clearly in the middle of a conversation but we we're like we have to say hi because jack and i were walking around with our cameras like we did at at the uh uh art thing at art at American Colors is what it was called. Um, so it's like, here is Sam. It's us with our cameras in the space that he remembers. Us. <laughs> and we walk up to him and we're like, hey, Sam, how's it going? And like, I'm so glad we said hello. But at the same time, I, he was just like, huh? Oh, hey, how's it going? <laughs> Like, and it, was, it said with no malice to him because we just like we're like sam what's up man and he's like talking to someone he was like hauling a box out of a building like it had full of records so i'm sure it had very much to do with like his musical career so anyway we just caught him way off guard but 
like we ended up walking around with him and uh at, at the at the photo walk and he's i mean a, a legend in his photography work and that term of that concept of like access that we're kind of talking about it's like oh i get to just go on a photo walk with sam precop like that's incredible like the the level playing field that got to come with that so in terms of a dream thing as a participant thank you so much for that like it was oh, truly gosh. an incredible day um and i i hope something like that can happen again well that's the plan we really do want to make it an annual thing um i, I just i think that event was so fun and like I don't know much about photography and I know a lot of people are very precious about their cameras and like the fact that people were just so open to like letting me touch it and like stand like under their like I guess it's four by five what is it called the large the camera, format large yeah. format yeah, yeah where you like have to stick your head in it and like it's like wow you're letting me stick my head in this <laughs> like that's I mean I know it, that's something we probably can't do now but right? yeah <laughs> um it was just such an, an amazing curtain. Yes, yeah, yes, as, we, as it's known and now. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, I think something along the lines of that event. And then obviously, like, having animals there would be a dream, too. Oh, we yes. Love, we love – that's one of our jokes is we call ourselves granite cats and dogs. Uh, so, <laughs> maybe there can be a petting zoo animals. at the carnival. Yeah, like they're really – ethical We had a petting zoo. zoo there recently. Oh, no we way. Had, I, yeah, for my birthday, we had a petting zoo. Wow. wow. Uh, Harp Wolf, thanks for the follow. Thank you for hey. traveling with us today. Danielle, shout out. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, just reveal. Reveal our anonymous guests. Yeah, Talks sorry. Them live on stream. <laughs> hey, I didn't give last names. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I am. I apologize. Harp Wolf, thank you for joining us. No, it's good. No, it's good. Just like, <laughs> I like harping on that, you know? <laughs> Got me in the mood. Oh, I sure. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, Marianne, what is the... Uh, what is the most valuable tool in your creative kit? Valuable tool? I yeah. think uh, it's probably the platform that I have access to. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, the, the fact that there's just like this never-ending landscape of Granite City. Um, yeah, I think the physical location is the most valuable tool for sure. Space is so important space is super important and, and i think we come back to it time and time again is like access to space as a part of a creative career is like pivotal it's like so key yeah yeah and i think the fact that there's like you know the majority of artists that we show at gcat are midwestern based artists and like the fact that there's just an amazing community of artists just surrounding us like i mean we wouldn't exist without them and so yeah i think that's I don't want to call artists tools. Um, <laughs> in the purest sense. Not yeah. in the, in the... <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, it's well, and I love to, when, when I love this question from Rick, because um, oftentimes, like some people will come up with something extremely specific and, and it, like, this is the thing that sets, you know, me over the top. And then some people will bring up a tool that's like a Swiss army knife. You know, like that is technically oh, one tool, okay. but it has like 20 tools in it. You know, so that's why I feel like GCAT is kind of like maybe your Swiss Army knife in a way that it's Whoa. it's it's a truly limitless tool, despite it, you know, being it has a name for this one object, despite having many uh, uses. Yeah. Yeah. And my questions are intentionally vague and misleading. You know, it's <laughs> kind of kind of the thing I've realized about this whole show is that like. I try to ask questions that are like just vague enough, just misleading enough <laughs> that we can get like a really wide range of answers. Um, but Absolutely. I mean, that's like a perfect answer to that. And, and I think it's good to be able to own that and, and say like, you know, my, my space with that um, or, or your experience with that space like has been so pivotal to your development. And other people can, can know that and, and, and can look for that. Swiss Army knife. T Green Girl That's likes that. Really, I really like that. That's okay, wonderful. Yeah. For a, an adult sandbox and a Swiss Army knife. 